Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Water School webinar brought to you by IceWarm and thank you for joining us today. We're going to be discussing unlocking water resources to expand agriculture and it's going to be presented by Adrian Costa from the Department of Environment and Water in South Australia and Dirk Melance from CSIRO, uh, both from the Gorda Institute. My name's Trevor Piller. Uh, I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at IceWarm and the Chair of the Australian Water School webinars. It's fantastic to have you all here across the world. You can see the map on screen now. What a great spread. We really appreciate you taking the time on this um, highly important topic. Um, now, the upcoming training, I won't go through each one, but every month it looks like this, six or seven uh, free webinars and online courses. Uh, do join us where you can. Uh, go to our website and you'll see the registration buttons for each one of those. We'd love to have you join us. Getting right into it now. Uh, two presenters, Adrian Costar and Dirk Melance. Uh, Adrian Costar is a senior hydrologist with the South Australian Department of Water, Environment and Water um, and worked in disciplines of hydrogeology and geophysics for more than 18 years. Dirk Melance is from CSIRO, the premier um, research organisation in Australia, and Dirk's a senior principal research scientist with CSIRO Land and Water, a background in soil and groundwater hydrology with more than 25 years experience. You can tell from those, just those small introductions, how much um, um, experience is with us today. So thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Dirk, for joining us. And where are you joining us from today? Oh, hi, Trevor. Yeah, just uh, down, the, uh, down the aisle, I think, uh, in the centre of Adelaide. So uh, well, it's lovely here today. Fantastic. Adelaide, same as myself, the same building, same place. And Dirk, yourself? Well, I'm at the, the Green and uh, Quiet Waits campus also in Adelaide. I've heard that it's beautiful out there. At, um, um, uh, uh, just outside the city of Adelaide in, in South Australia. Wonderful to have you both with us. Uh, and, um, um, and, some, and some beautiful artwork behind you. Adrian, I have to comment on the artwork. Oh, it's fantastic. Well. Do it yourself. Yeah, I did. I painted that on the weekend. I hope you like yes, it. Slap, slap that up. I'll bet. I think that won, a, won an award somewhere, but I don't couldn't quite know where. It looks really good. Um, and uh, I, I won't come in on the on the writing behind you, Dirk, because I can see some names there, which... No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> it's lovely to have you both working and in place. Um, um, not especially, you know, as presenters, but working in the field of um, uh, water and hydrogeology. Well, Let's press on. Um, thank you everyone for answering those questions at the front there, what sector you're from. Uh, the winner is government policy, which you can see on your screens there. Um, any comments from Adrian or Dirk about who we have on board and our utilities? Probably a bit sad not to see a water authority with us, but um, it's all right. It'll be recorded and they'll probably see it after. Um, and the winner of the second question is water for irrigated agriculture. Yeah, probably. Uh, speaks more about the sheer number of people working each of those fields, I'd imagine. Uh, groundwater for arid environments might not have as many people working in it, but both are important, obviously, to the attendees. So we're glad of that. Um, well, look, um, this is going to be um, um, straightforward. Adrian's going to go first and then Dirk. Uh, and it's on a topic uh, that talks about finding new sources of water. Um, one's very different to the other, but they're both, they're both so relevant uh, for their particular fields, one one in um, expanding agriculture and the other in, is in um, expanding the community development or helping community development in arid areas. <clears throat> and Dirk will talk about that second one. And Adrian, you're off to a start on the first one. So without anything more to say, I'm uh, ready to hand completely over to you, Adrian, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Keep your questions coming, everybody, and um, if they're uh, particularly relevant, we'll have a little inter uh, interruption where it needs to be. Um, as um, Adrian and Dirk are speaking. But for now, over to you, Adrian. Oh, look, thanks very much, Trevor. I really uh, appreciate the introduction. And um, look, uh, welcome everyone. I know there's a lot of people tuned in here right across the world from uh, differing disciplines. Uh, so I hope you find this presentation both interesting and informative. Um, look, before I get into what is G-Flows, look, it sounds like a cartoon that I used to watch when I was a kid, uh, G-Force, but uh, that's showing my age. Um, look, I'd just like to thank the Gorda Institute for Water Research and its partners, uh, including the CSIRO, uh, Flinders University of South Australia, uh, Department for Energy and Mining through the Geological Survey of South Australia, and the Department for Environment and Water. 
uh, which provide the necessary funding. I'd also like to thank the APY executive and the traditional owners and the community for allowing us onto the lands. Uh, without them, um, this project wouldn't have been possible. So my name is Adrian Costa. I'm a senior hydrogeologist uh, with the Department for Environment and Water. Been there around about 15 years and uh, based in Adelaide. So what is GFLOWS? What does it stand for? It actually stands for the Gorda Facilitating or Finding Long-Term Outback Water Solutions. It's a collaborative multidiscipline partnership, currently in stage three, but started way back in 2011 with stage one and two uh, by interpreting or reinterpreting the developing uh, methodologies to detect this hidden water. Uh, but it's now in stage three, and that uses this innovative methodology to identify features in the landscape and drilling to determine their feasibility as water targets. Uh, stage three also has developed mapping tools, um, which will help guide water exploration in the area. And the project itself had a fair bit of publicity. We actually had the Premier of South Australia out there warming his boots uh, with the drillers back in um, it was July 2018. And also we were featured in an article uh, in the Sunday Mail uh, in March. So it's uh, fairly exciting. So it begs the question, what is groundwater and why is this hidden resource so valuable? Uh, look, groundwater is everywhere. It's even beneath our feet. Uh, it's a hidden resource underneath the ground and extracting it really depends on the formation material. And that is why we look for aquifers. The resource is used extensively across the world, um, but it's in Ad cities like Adelaide where it's relying on. Um, in Adelaide in particular, um, during times of drought in the 1970s, it was actually used to supplement the main supply but it's also used here commercially uh, with beverage processing um, and breweries and Coca-Cola and also irrigation golf courses. But it's outside of Adelaide in these regional centres. Um, it's sometimes the only viable water resource, uh, particularly in desert regions like the APY lands in Northwest and South Australia, where there is really a lack of surface water. So where is the APY lands? Well, it's essentially a two day drive north of Adelaide or a five hour drive south west of Alice Springs, which is in the center of Australia. It's indigenous lands. You actually require a permit to visit. There's a population around 2,000 to 3,000 people. And the settlements consist of communities or homelands. It's an arid environment uh, with a rainfall typically less than 200 millimeters per year. So if we now focus on um, this next slide, the APY lands extends from the Western Australian border near the community of uh, Pithinjara up to the north, the Northern Territory, and is also in the east, uh, bounded by the Stewart Highway and the community of Indulkna. Our study area spans from Armata in the west uh, through Fregon, where we've focused a lot of our efforts through to Mimili uh, in the east. The area, and this is our study area again, you see Armata there on the west and Mimili there on the east. Um, and the area is governed in the north and boasts the highest mountain range in South Australia. In fact, Mount Woodruff that you see there is around about 1435 metres above sea level. And the rocks consist of gneisses and granites, approximately 1600 million years old. The region is still tectonically active. So this is now um, where on the lands here, uh, looking north, the plains sit around five to 600 metres above sea level. In the background, we can see the Musgrave Ranges, which again sit at about 1400 metres above sea level. Uh, it's a desert region, and so there's a lack of surface water and a reliance on groundwater. In fact, the Department for Environment and Water uh, with SA Water manage the groundwater resource for the community supply with real-time data beamed into Adelaide. In the foreground, you'll notice that there is a recently constructed groundwater well. And so it begs the question, where is this groundwater located since there is a lack of surface water features? So if we now look at the location of groundwater wells that are not backfilled or dry, um, you can see that they actually follow the modern day uh, creek lines. The yields are typically less than two litres per second, but more typically around one litre a second, and generally they're shallow in construction. So this is the modern day landscape, but what about the ancient landscape? Valleys were formed in the tertiary around about 65 to 3 million years ago by incision of up to 70 metres into the weathered bedrock. The valley is subsequently filled with sediments during warm and wet subtropical to tropical climate forming infill of the Paleo Valley system. 
And it's really this ancient landscape or Paleo Valley system we're interested in. Uh, we know they exist, but are they water targets? We wanted to test the feasibility based on previous G-Flow's work in stage one and stage two. The previous work involved reinterpretation of airborne geophysical surveys and development of methods. Geophysical methods are like a scan beneath our feet. Uh, we don't know what is beneath the ground unless we drill, and geophysics provides us insight without disturbing the ground. So in 2016, an airborne electromagnetic survey, or uh, AEM survey, was flown. Uh, as you can see here, here's the APY lands. We've got the community of Pippinjara in the west, uh, the community of Indokna in the east. Uh, here's our study area, uh, Armata up here, Mimli down here. And this uh, transparent uh, black shadow is actually the footprint of the AEM survey that, as I said, was conducted in 2016. It covers about two thirds of the APY lands and it involved two systems, a fixed wing system known as Tempest uh, to the west and a helicopter system known as SkyTem to the east. Uh, they both incorporate a transmitter and receiver, um, the transmitter to transmit the signal and a receiver to receive the signal. So what do we get is conductivity variability beneath the ground. Uh, the reds here signify areas of conductive zones, uh, blues are the resistive areas. Uh, we get slices of regional variability and conductivity with depth up to a, you know, generally about 150 meters depending on the signal strength. Uh, and now we can start to see the ancient landscape being revealed, including the Paleo Valley system. You'll notice here, if we move south of Armata, we see this red sort of section through here. Uh, this is what's known as the Lindsay West Paleo Valley. And where our focus will be is the Lindsay East Paleo Valley that just uh, is uh, east of the town of Fregon. So all the community of Fregon. So you can see now that we're starting to see this ancient landscape in the Paleo Valley system. So let's look at in some more detail. Here we focus on the SkyTem data uh, the, on the eastern side uh, near the Lindsay East Paleo Valley. We're looking at a slice of 50 to 60 metres below the ground. Again, reds are conductive, um, blues are resistive, and now we can start to see more closely this Lindsay East Paleo Valley just to the east of the community of Fregon. If we now look at a slice that's a little bit deeper, uh, 90 to 100 metres beneath the ground, again, uh, reds are conductive features, blues are resistive features. Uh, we can start to see now that those reds disappear, if I toggle between the two and they turn into yellows, which means less conductive, and this may indicate the bottom of the Paleo Valley sediments. So we can use the AEM to reveal the Paleo Valley system within the ancient landscape. The AEM gives us confidence and a spatial accuracy and gives us a target so we don't go drilling at random, therefore potentially saving money. So we went drilling in 2018 with the permission granted by the APY executive, the traditional owners and the community. And we chose the Lindsay East Paleo Valley as a target site. Again, here's Fregon, the community of Fregon. We're just outside of that, about five kilometers to the southeast. Uh, we chose this uh, location due to the presence of the Paleo Valley, but also the cultural permissions, the accessibility, given there's a main road in close proximity. In fact, access was from the main road that joins Fregon to the next community, which is Mimili and proximity to the Fregon community uh, and gr other groundwater supplies, because then we have groundwater data and this will help with our conceptualization for the project. It's important to note, uh, there was not one well drilled historically in this location, and perhaps that was because there was a lack of features on the surface. So it begs the question, were we successful? Well, I think you'll see from this video, our find was um, in fact very significant and we found water. The drilling revealed a number of water bearing zones and one of which was around about 55 to 65 meters below the ground and a sweet spot if you like. Uh, salinities were quite low. They were under a thousand parts per million or milligrams per liter, which is if you know potable supply, it's under 500. Uh, human body can sort of tolerate anything under 1500. Uh, certainly for irrigation, anything under a thousand is very, very good. Uh, the other imp impressive um, Part to this was the yield. And in fact, it's five times what the existing wells exhibit, as we saw from a previous slide. So it also revealed the Paleo Valley sediments were around about 100 to 110 meters thick. 
and it was encouraging since it aligned with the AEM data. We also managed to collect some core in the centre of the Paleo Valley uh, with the help of the Geological Survey of South Australia, and we were able to date this core. And uh, it was the first time any sort of dating like this had been done in the APY lands, which is very exciting. And the core also revealed marine material. Now, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder here, but this find alone could change the way we think about the evolution of the continent. But it's early days, and it might provide some further thought to some other geologists. So the question is, uh, what have we learned? Uh, the AEM uh, provided a target which guided our drilling. The drilling confirmed the location of the target, uh, that is the Paleo Valley. Uh, the drilling also confirmed the feasibility um, of the idea that these Paleo Valleys are significant water targets. And now there's a potential upscale sale this uh, find to the wider AEM data set. One of the uh, outputs from the GFLOWS project, certainly stage three, is a mapping tool. You'll see here, um, we've got the brownfield polygons, which represent the 2012 data layer uh, produced by Geoscience Australia of the Paleo Valleys. I've overlaid the AEM footprint, which is uh, contained within the, the pink border, as you can see. We've got Armitage up here, community of Mimili down here. This is the footprint of the AEM uh, data. And so you'll see as we start to go within that, uh, we've interpreted uh, we've in, reinterpreted the AEM data and ref, refined the Paleo Valley using the 2016 AEM data and the 2018 drilling information. And we, what we know, notice now is more complexity, complexity. Complexity. So if we now look at, take a closer look, we can see the detail of this Paleo Valley extent. Again, it's more complex. Uh, the line in the middle, the dashed line, is actually the Thalweg, which is the thickest part of the Paleo Valley. That's really important to know. And this provides an important uh, guide to water exploration. The take home message here is that we step on the Paleo Valley and yields are potentially five times the amount of water than if we had stepped off of them. So in conclusion, uh, GFLOWS discovered potentially a new groundwater resource offset from the historical locations. This is really a great find, but we require further testing and this testing will help us protect the resource by increasing our understanding. We need to understand how extensive the resource is. Are we just lucky where we've drilled and found this uh, water uh, target? Or well, if we follow this Paleo Valley north and south, do we tap into some similar water bearing systems? And what about other systems like the Lindsay West Paleo Valley, uh, just south of Armitage? Do we get the same conditions, the same sort of water targets? And the other question is, is are these paleo valleys um, water bearing in the same quantity and quality as we've found here? However, even this find is significant and it may, and it potentially provides a water security for the community, particularly for Freegon, but it also may provide further economic growth opportunities, but they really must fit with the capacity of the resource and fit with the community needs and desires. And one of those growth opportunities is agriculture, but ultimately it comes down to what community want. Look, if you'd like to uh, read a little bit further about the project, we've actually released a couple of or published a couple of papers that are in the MESA journal uh, that the Geological Survey and the Department for Environmental Mining um, uh, produce. So I encourage you to go to those links. They're uh, off of ResearchGate. And here's my contact information. I also want to uh, touch on that this is uh, a culmination of other people's work, to be honest with you. I'm just leading up, just the figurehead. Um, but I, I really need to thank um, Tim Monday from the CSIRO and his team for putting this together. Also, uh, Andy Love from the Flinders University of South Australia and his team, and Carmen Krupp from the Geological Survey of South Australia, uh, the Department for Energy and Mining. So thanks so much, Trevor. I'll hand it back to you. It's fantastic, Adrian. I can't believe how much um, significant amount of work has been just um, summarised there in the space of a few minutes. Uh, you've done a fantastic job of um, making it clear with graphs and pictures. I'm, I'm running on now, but um, I, I just find this fascinating to see. And as you say, depending on the um, um, community needs and wants uh, and upon the resource, here we go for some um, um, great opportunities to find water at such an extent, five times the amount of the traditional drilling spots. And who knows, a bit more... Um, uh, research will tell us whether we just happen to be in the right spot, right time, or uh, or whether this is a consistent Paleo Valley um, result. It's just terrific. Oh, well, 
haven't seen any questions and comments coming up just yet. But uh, look, so um, we're going to head straight on now to yourself, Dirk, um, to talk about the Northern Adelaide, Adelaide Plains and the and the potential for uh, sustainable expansion of irrigated, irrigated agriculture um, and in the Northern Adelaide Corridor. So, um, yep, no more from me. Up to you, Dirk. Leave it over to you. I do by me, all means, everyone. Um, uh, there's a couple there from Julie and Adnan. Um, let's maybe just take these couple because they're right back on what Adrian was talking about. Um, you'll see on your Q&A, Adrian, uh, window that uh, Julie has asked, um, will the research also look at links uh, elsewhere? Look, I think um, it, uh, in terms of links, I'm assuming uh, other sort of spin-off research. Um, look, I, I think that one of the things that's come out from this, uh, as I sort of mentioned in one of the uh, later slides, was uh, we had the opportunity to date the core, and, and now I know there's some people working in uh, Victoria uh, saying that this could have some implications on the evolution of the continent. So that's pretty pretty exciting. Um, in terms of uh, other links, I know that... Um, um, obviously, agriculture is is one of the things that could be a, a good growth area, but again, you know, it depends what the community want. Um, certainly, we're we're trying to get the message out um, through our publications to show what good work has happened. But um, you know, it's early days. We've got to do a little bit more research and really firm up this resource. Um, but yeah, we're we're hoping to um, obviously get it out there, and and you never know where those links might happen. Yep, that's good. Another one from Bruce Monday down at Aldinga in South Australia. Adrian, can you tell us how old the water is? Oh, look, uh, it's early stages. We have uh, done some environmental tracer work. Uh, that, those results have just come in. Um, I won't talk about it in too much detail. In fact, um, Andy loves, uh, you know, heading up that, that area. But um, uh, I can tell you that it's not as old as what we thought it was. It, it, partic it may be around 3,000 to 10,000 years. Uh, and those implications might mean is that um, it certainly doesn't come from the ranges. Um, it's a lot more modern than the water that would come from there. Um, so there must be a recharge zone in between. So, but it's early days, it's really hard to say, but um, there's sort of some, yep. uh, you know, that, that's sort of the, the range that we're looking at. In the, in the uh, another one from Masood in Canberra, the Bureau of Met, uh, as this is an old and non-renewable resource, are you not worried about the long-term planning for expansion uh, of agriculture here? I think we discussed this before we started today, Adrian. Yeah, we did. I mean, this is just uh, new. This is uh, just using some uh, methodologies that have been developed um, since 2011 through the uh, CSIRO. We've now had the opportunity to drill. And uh, the question was, is what is actually in these paddock valleys? And I mean, yeah. it's funny when you look back and you go, well, it actually could have been dry. <laughs> Might have not been anything there. Right. I think one of the early things is that it actually, um, if anything else, it firms up security of a water supply for the community. Uh, in terms of um, how it can be used, it's up to the community. But again, we, do, we need to do some, some further work. We need to um, potentially drill or do some more work on this Paleo Valley and other Paleo Valleys to see exactly uh, how big this resource is. Um, and that'll help us you know, answer questions um, like that one. Yep. Uh, Adnan says, what is the helicopter on airborne check used for? That's the geophysics. I think um, probably, well, maybe it's a good question to ask. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, geophysics comes in various forms. Uh, one of them is airborne geophysics, um, airborne electromagnetic (AEM) for short, and uh, it's a it's a it's a concept that um, CSIRO are heavily involved with, it, including Geoscience Australia, uh, and it really just gives us a scan beneath the ground. The reason why it's great is because it can cover quite a large mm. distance in you know a short mm. amount of time. Uh, it's non-invasive. And uh, in this project, it was used to uh, detect the ancient landscape, in particular these water, potentially water targets, which now we know that um, one of them looks like a potential water target, uh, in order to locate our drilling, just so we weren't drilling randomly. So it actually locates the paleo valleys. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Remotely, rather than, mm. yeah, yeah, and covers all the ground all at once quite quickly. Mm. That's great. Uh, and then also says, will you just be mapping the area? What's the next stage? to try to associate your findings with weather, weather conditions uh, that might change water availability? Uh, look, uh, we're sort of uh, thinking about what the next stages are, but we've, we're sort of trying to wrap up this project and get some really valuable uh, tools, if you like, um, one of them being the map, uh, and then we'll have a think about um, how we move forward. But um, 
obviously it all comes down to you know uh, funding and things like that so uh, if there is an interest then um, yeah, perhaps we can do some more work uh, Fauzia has asked an interesting question he's from the Terry School of Advanced Studies in New Delhi assistant professor there about 80 percent of India's agriculture is irrigated using groundwater up from 20 percent in 1950 so it's a huge jump mm. 80 percent to no, 20 percent to 80 percent um, and most most of India's uh, overexploited yeah, groundwater. It'd be interesting to learn the kind of regulations Australia would have to put in place to avoid this overexploitation of groundwater for agriculture, probably for another day. Do you think, Adrian? It is. I mean, water management is obviously the maybe Dirk as well. You know the way the way that um, you need to go about it, and I think um, you know we won't go into too much detail here, but we do have our prescribed wells areas around. Um, around South Australia that help guide that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we might leave it there. Uh, and Fauzi, that might be an, another question you'd like to put to Adrian and Dirk on uh, out of this session. Be, be, you're very welcome to do that. And anyone, anyone else, of course, too. Uh, but look, we'll leave it there for now. And we'll go straight to uh, Dirk's presentation. Um, and any comments you would like to make on any of those questions, Dirk, feel free, uh, of course. So, but over to you right now. Thanks, Trevor. And I wanted to say uh, good afternoon, everyone. But since we're covering many time zones, I'll just say hello. Um, yeah. I'm Dirk Mullins from the CSRO, uh, based in Adelaide. And I'm delighted uh, to give a high-level overview of this uh, Goiter, uh, in Goiter Institute's research project on sustainable expansion of irrigated agriculture and horticulture in the Northern Adelaide Corridor. It's a project we finished uh, a few months ago. Uh, which includes contributions from SARDI or the South Australian Research and Development uh, Institute, the University of South Australia, Flinders University, the University of Adelaide and the CSIRO. And I feel really privileged that I've been working uh, with this group of people under the leadership of Professor Jim Cox uh, from uh, SARDI. And as I said, this will be a high level overview for those of you um, that want to have a closer look. Um, I will uh, conclude with uh, a number of web links that have all the reports, the data, and also the models that we used. So let's have a look at the high level objective of this project, which was really about how and where can additional water sources, including recycled water, be used for irrigation while minimizing risks for salinization, solidification, and suboptimal crop yield in the northern Lake Plains around Virginia. And for those of you that are not familiar with the uh, region, with the Northern Adelaide Plains, it's just north uh, of Adelaide, uh, roughly between the Gawler and Light River. And it's an area where there's currently about just under 6,000 hectares uh, used for horticultural production. And the uh, estimate is that with additional recycled water from the Bolivar uh, Waste Treatment Plan, we could expand that um, up to about 3,000 hectares for new irrigated cropping. Now in order to uh, answer that, that question, uh, the project plan identified a number of knowledge gaps, uh, which include what is indeed the amount and the quality of water that can be applied at, at different times of the year, uh, what is then the impact of, of using water of different quality, sometimes of somewhat higher salinity, on soil health and crop productivity, especially if you use that water for several decades, uh, what is the extent on the one hand of resilient areas and on the other hand more vulnerable areas where we can uh, expand irrigation uh, subject to uh, additional management practices being assured. There are also knowledge gaps in regards to soil attributes that we need to feed in models that will predict the impact of using recycled water for, for many uh, years to come and also develop uh, some high level guidelines uh, around the sustainable use of the recycled water. And a final knowledge gap was to identify the depth to shallow, uh, often here, at least in South Australia, saline groundwater, uh, as this can be a source of, of salinization uh, by capillary rise, or can induce uh, water logging uh, in case of excessive irrigation. So I'll walk you through um, a number of these knowledge gaps and what we've found uh, so far. So let's start by looking at uh, the amount and the quality of, of additional water that can be applied uh, for this region. And uh, let's start with uh, recycled water. Now there's currently about 17 gigalitres per year that is available through the uh, Virginia Pipeline Scheme, uh, 
uh, for irrigation, which has a salinity of just over a thousand milligrams per liter total dissolved solids. The new, the main new source um, of water will be through the uh, Northern Adelaide Irrigation Scheme of the NAIS, um, where there's a commitment to provide 20 gigalitres per year in two stages. And the salinity is uh, of similar uh, level as the existing irrigation water from the VPS. So these are uh, committed um, volumes of additional water all the rest uh, or estimates that, that we made in, uh, in this project. And there's some additional uh, research that is needed to prove them and also to uh, identify what are the uh, storage capacity, uh, transportation and potentially treatment infrastructure. Those additional sources of water as some of them uh, do have a somewhat higher salinity. But let me just pick up two of those. Um, stormwater from uh, greenhouse uh, roofs, for instance, is projected to provide about 5.7 gigalitres of additional water per year, um, with an additional two gigalitres if you assume a 30% increase in the area of, of greenhouses over the next 10 years. And interestingly, this is of course water of an excellent uh, quality with a very low um, dissolved uh, solid. Um, another source of additional water will be surface water from the Gwala River, uh, we estimated that there's probably going to be around 7.4 gigalitres per year, all of this highly variable during the year. Um, however, its quality is similar to that of the uh, existing um, VPS and of the future NAIS water. So if we look at um, the quality of those three sources, it is great to have these additional um, sources of water. However, um, at this um, level of salinity, we're talking about 1.2 deci semen per meter. You do add uh, per year, per hectare of land, one um, ton, about one ton of salts. That's for one megaliter, which corresponds to 100 milliliters. So if you're irrigating a crop, let's say 500 millimeters um, of water per year, that means about five ton of salts per year, per hectare on those soils. So uh, this project looked at what the potential impacts are of using such water uh, in the long term. Uh, and that's what uh, my presentation will, uh, will focus on. Uh, but a few more words about um, the stormwater that one could collect from uh, greenhouse runoff. Uh, so there's currently just under 70,000 hectares of greenhouses in the Northern Adelaide Plains, which could collect up to about 5% gigaliters of, of water, and there's some good examples here, and there's some less good examples where the water is collected, but it's just um, ditched in a drain. So that's really a lost opportunity, probably because the, um, the storage facility, the storage capacity is, is not there, and storage can happen uh, on the surface or in the subsurface. And there's some estimates that if you use aqua storage and recovery, uh, a well of about um, 200 megalitres per year would require 60 hectares of, of greenhouse to provide uh, sufficient water for that system to be economic. And as I said, very low levels of, of salinity, uh, which means you could mix it with um, the recycled water. You have a larger volume of lower salinity water. Uh, you could use it for a specific uh, high yield crop that are sensitive to salinity, such as capsicums. Uh, or you could also use it in winter months when this water is available uh, to leach out the salt in the soil that have accumulated during uh, the growing season. We also talked about uh, surface water, uh, so the Gola River uh, during the months of July to September could provide about 9 gigalitres per year uh, with a salinity of about uh, 1100 megalitres per year. So similar to the, the NAIS and the VPS. Um, in terms of the specific chemicals that are relevant for crop growth, um, chloride is slightly higher than the water from the Bolivar uh, wastewater treatment plant, but sodium and boron, two critical elements, um, are at the same level. So, however, this would require additional uh, storage, again, surface or subsurface, and um, distribution infrastructure. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, let's have a look at um, the potential impact of using this, this water on soil health and uh, crop productivity. And the scenario we're looking at is one 
where we're looking at the reduction in potential yield of the crops you see in the table um, for four key soils, um, most prominent soils in the area, calcarea soils, hardwood grounds, sand over clay, and deep uniform degradational soils. Uh, we're looking at 32 years of, of continuous irrigation with the recycled water from the NICE scheme. Why 32 years? Well, we're looking in the future. We started the simulations 2019 until 2050. So that's um, just over three decades. So what the table shows um, is the reduction in potential yield in percentage. And there's basically three classes. You have the crops on a green background. So there's virtually no loss uh, in production uh, or just up to 10%, such as potato under deep uniform gradation of soils. Then there's the um, crops on the orange background. They have a loss of production between 10 and 20%. Almonds, pasture, uh, so they're more sensitive to um, saline conditions. And then there's the rather saline, uh, so rather uh, sensitive crops, the so salinity, carrots, onions, and potatoes. And their loss can be up to 30% uh, or more. Now, how did we get there? So, I'll show you the results first. Um, what are the tools that that we use to get there. So we use a biophysical model that integrates the soil, the crop and the climate, the hydrous model. Um, you may be familiar with it or not, but it's developed by the US Salinity Laboratory in uh, Riverside, California, which is one of the labs from the USDA, United States Agriculture. And it includes all the possible uh, water redistribution processes you can think of uh, in the soil. And it has also the unique capability that it um, can account for the major ions, major ion uh, mobility uptake by plants and uh, precipitation and dissolution of um, chemicals, um, solids that are relevant for um, irrigation. <clears throat> now, how are we able to define this reduction in yield? Well, that's based on this or these uh, salinity threshold models, which are for each crop listed here. They're based on, on many trials, and they basically show as a function of electrical connectivity uh, in the soil water, in the horizontal axis, they show the relative yield, and they start, of course, um, 100% uh, with a very, for a very low um, salinity, so there's no loss of yield, and then there's a certain um, threshold value beyond which uh, they start to, to drop off, the yield decreases, and it typically uh, continues to decrease in a linear uh, fashion. And this model or these models were incorporated in the Hydra's tool to get a reasonable, accurate uh, assessment of the yield loss for this long-term irrigation uh, scenario. So this was basically a, a reference or a base case scenario in terms of least yield loss. Uh, against which we can now consider um, management practices to mitigate against the negative impacts from the use of recycled water. And I'm just um, showing you um, a few of the findings, a few snapshots. Again, the details are in the, in the report. So one of the scenarios looked at a gypsum application, so calcium sulfate, uh, which is essential to control uh, subsoil and irrigation-induced sodicity. Uh, so uh, these soils may also suffer uh, sodicity and the use of, of gypsum uh, in the area is, is a quite common practice so farmers have already adopted to, um, to those conditions as, as soils certainly in South Australia naturally are quite high in, in sodium and, and, and may be at risk of, um, uh, of, of losing uh, the capacity to infiltrate water they may form crusts at the surface which leads to, to um, ponding and all that results, of course, in suboptimal growth uh, conditions for, for plants. Um, in some cases, people even uh, use soluble calcium and mix that with the irrigation water. Um, for the sand of the clay soils, to give you one example, um, if you grow potatoes, we found that uh, with recycled water, if you add um, on an annual basis, about 1.7 cubic and tons uh, per hectare of gypsum, um, that will um, be sufficient to avoid um, the soil reaching critical levels of sodicity. In terms of reducing the uh, risks from salinity, uh, we looked at blending, blending the recycled water 
with uh, mains water, for instance, in a ratio, or have a cyclic use of, uh, on the one hand, recycled water, mains water, either on a monthly basis or, or six monthly, and then see what's, uh, what's happening with the salinity. And it was shown to be uh, most effective in calcareous soils and sand over clay soils, but less effective so in the uh, less permeable, a more clay, uh, hard red brown uh, soils. We also looked at uh, apply increased leaching rates. So typically in the area, they would uh, apply 20% more irrigation just to leach out the soils that have accumulated in the profile during the growing season. Uh, we looked at uh, increasing that to 30, 40, even 50% for some soils. Uh, that did help, but of course, the risk is that where you would have rather shallow groundwater tables, that may result in water logging in anoxic conditions, which again is to be uh, avoided. Um, also note that uh, with these higher uh, leaching rates, you do increase, of course, the uh, amount of water that is draining the shallow groundwater. Uh, can be up to three megaliter per, per hectare. Um, water that also contains um, excess uh, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, there's a number of additional management uh, options one, one can uh, apply. Uh, we didn't um, explicitly test those, but we know that in the area, um, farmers apply, for instance, organic amendments, which will help to maintain uh, a good soil structure uh, where the soil is naturally high in sodium. Um, so that is to combat the sodicity issues. Um, improved drainage may be important where you have shallow groundwater. Um, you may consider to use uh, more salt tolerant cultivars, um, etc. Um, interestingly, um, there has been some research by Kelly a while ago where they looked at what is the impact of using reclaimed water, so from the uh, Virginia Pipeline scheme on um, salinity and sodicity, and they found that after 40 15 years, there wasn't any material impact. So that's good. Okay, I will now uh, take you through some of the baseline data that we collected uh, and some interpretations um, that will reflect the current status of, of the soil. And as, as you can imagine for this kind of studies, a lot of effort went into collecting a new baseline soil data for main uh, soil groups. Um, as I said, the hundred browns, and I'm giving you a percentage of the area covered in, in the focus area. Um, deep uniform degradational, about 13%. There's calcareous soils and the more sandy soils cover 10% of the area. And the different dots indicate the uh, soil pits or the profiles where we got samples to analyze, to analyze for chemical properties and also uh, hydrologic properties, such as infiltration capacity, the water uh, characteristic retention and uh, depth to groundwater. And this, this data, of course, um, was in the, the, the model, the hydrous model. Um, this data is showing the, uh, the current um, status in terms of, of salinity at three different depths, zero to 10, 10 to 30, and 30 to 60 centimeter depth. There are six classes of, of salinity from very low, the light blue to very dark red, extreme, extremely saline soils. We look at the shallower depths, let's say up to 30 centimeters, at least for the soils that we analyze, it's not too bad. It's, it's up to uh, medium salinity. And you can, that relate, you can relate that to uh, crops that, that you might grow under those conditions. Um, if we're looking at um, soils that have a very low salinity rating, you could grow turnip and all the other crops that would be more resistant um, to, to high levels of salinity. However, if you're looking at the medium group, you could no longer grow, let's say, almonds, grapes, and onions, but you'd focus on dates, figs, etc. Although I probably have to correct myself when you say you can't grow them. Yes, you could still grow them, but um, the yield would be suboptimal. And that is exactly what we demonstrated in, um, in the previous um, graph, in the previous slide, how much loss of production you would have if you would exceed certain levels of uh, of salinity. Um, this um, graph shows you the sodicity risk, so that's that's the current uh, the current status. Um, 
as, as we said, uh, sodic soils um, have a high level of, of sodium on the exchange complex, uh, mainly clays or organic matter. And the parameter that we use to express this property is the ESP, of the exchangeable sodium percent, of this percentage of sodium on the exchange, exchange complex. And when you reach about a factor of six, level six, then you assume that the soil is, 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 um, is sodic. Um, now to understand the risk of the soils uh, to lose their, their structure and, and uh, to lose um, the ability to infiltrate water, to start crusting, etc., you typically also include the electrical conductivity. And then there's, there's broadly three areas. Area one um, indicates the dispersive soils. So these are highly sodic soils. Um, soils in this area are, are at risk. Um, of, of losing their, their structure with all the other issues involved. Then there's um, the area in, in yellow, that's um, soils that are potentially uh, dispersive, and there's, there's, there's quite a few if, if you go deeper in the profile. And then it depends um, if you apply minimum tillage uh, and key pasture, that is group 2A, um, they would not disperse, so you're safe. Um, 2B are those soils that are spontaneous dispersive, if you would not apply calcium to displace the sodium from the exchanger. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's quite a few soils in, in that condition or in that region. And then there's the flocculated soils, 3A. These are stable soils uh, that have sufficiently low sodium uh, on their uh, exchange complex. So this is, a, this is information that, that can be used to inform uh, farmers about, about management practices. It could also be used to select those soils uh, that are least sensitive uh, for irrigation development uh, or those that are most sensitive and the ones that are most sensitive, for instance, could be uh, put aside for uh, developments with, with hydroponics, <coughs> which, which would re uh, not require the use of natural soil. Now, the uh, soil hydrological data was also used to uh, predict the future irrigation requirements for these key crops on, on the most important soils. And we did that for historic and, and future climate. Historic would not be much of use except to compare with the future and see how much increase in, in irrigation we expect under a hotter and drier climate. Uh, so we're using a downscaled um, data set from, from a GCM model, uh, which had a medium a CO2 scenario uh, which predicts, at least in South Australia, the climate will be hotter. On average, the maximum daily temperature would increase by uh, 1.3 centigrade, and it would be drier. On average, uh, the annual um, amount of rain would decrease by almost 7%, and you would also have more dry spells. Under those conditions, um, the dual uh, crop coefficient approach, the FAO, FAO 56 dual crop, Coefficient approach um, indicated that there is an increase uh, of the irrigation requirement of about three to 11%, uh, and the largest increase is for annual crops. And the increase is also depending on the soil type, with the uh, more sandy soils um, being more susceptible to the more uh, clay soils. Now this uh, research has also delivered uh, a number of, of new analysis tools and, and, and modeling tools. Um, and they're shown, um, they're shown here. Uh, for instance, um, we developed some new calibration relationships to rapidly determine a number of soil properties. Oops, excuse me. Um, using mid-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, where you can scan the soil, um, and you can do that either in the field or in the lab, although in the lab is preferred because conditions are better constrained. And this graph is, is showing results uh, from a calibration where the mid-infrared is used uh, to measure the water content of, of the soil at, at certain pressure heads. And, and you see that across the range of uh, moving from dry to wet soils, there's a, there's a, there's a very good uh, correlation. So the predictive capacity of those new uh, relationships are, are quite good, um, very, very powerful tool. Uh, we also uh, extended the capability of the, the Hydrus uh, numerical model, 
with a module that can deal with um, the addition of, of gypsum uh, under, under solid conditions. So every, every year or at any time during, during the growing season, you can now add gypsum. It will dissolve uh, on the basis of the um, water content of the topsoil um, and also depending on the pH and other um, geochemical conditions um, of the topsoil. We also developed uh, a tool, a quite neat tool called IWQC2 to look at water options uh, for covered crops, for greenhouses. So farmers can now look at um, the different uh, waters that they have to their disposal and, and the quality and what mixes uh, would be required to uh, provide water of a certain quality to uh, certain crops. Uh, throughout uh, the year. And then finally, a number of um, non-invasive geophysical tools were used to identify uh, the depth of this shallow groundwater. And the most prospective was uh, shallow seismic, um, which was able to uh, detect shallow groundwater um, a few meters from, from the surface. And as I mentioned, uh, most of our reports, or all of our reports, are available on this Goiter Institute website. Uh, data sets are available through this website, and the CSR, CSIRO has their own data access portal. And there's a number of uh, publications which you can access. And yeah, I'll leave it at this. And thank you very much for your attention, and happy to take questions. Fantastic, Dirk. That's been such a um, uh, great rundown of all the issues uh, and the more I think about how much you looked at there and how much science has been done there um, it reminds me of the amount of money that's being spent bringing water out to that region if I remember rightly it's in the order of 150 million of federal money at least uh, federal Australian government money at least to to um, build the infrastructure to bring water out to the Northern Adelaide corridor so yes um, it matters that even though um, and un, you know the water that's coming there is n is not unreasonable level of salinity. It matters that they end up with five ton of salt per year in in some fairly medium applications. That's a number I wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, so um, there's some outstanding thing issues there, and the hydroponics issue is another one, of course, where the, the soil we can just bypass soil by using um. um hydroponics. Um, so no, thanks very much for that. Um, there's there's a question there and uh, we'll come to that but I just wanted to say and stay on board uh, both please Adrian and, and Dirk that'd be very 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 good thank you um, but um, my colleague Joel has just put up a number of links that you've um, mentioned in your talk uh, Dirk and also some links to the coming oh, to all the webinars oh we'll do that in a moment I can see um, but there's links there to the Gorda Institute's website and uh, soil data sets, fantastic journal publications. Uh, thanks for that, Joel, and and, uh, and Adrian's links down lower. I see that now too. Yeah, on the chat line if you want to go there. Uh, additionally, there's the webinar, um, Australian Water School webinars. All of our webinars, not just this one today, but um, uh, the 80 or so in the past, and many more coming up future. Um, look, let's go to the, the questions real quickly now. Uh, we've got about uh, five six minutes left. Um, uh, Fauzia has asked, uh, thanks Dirk for sharing some very insightful, um, useful findings. If you press on the Q&A button, Dirk, Adrian, you'll see this question here. Um, very useful for India, as soil is in many parts of India turned saline due to excess use of fertilizers and seawater intrusion in coastal areas. Uh, great comment, Fauzia. Thanks very much for that. That's, that's really useful to see. This is not just a, an Australian problem worldwide. Uh, Masood said, has irrigation requirement been calculated from predicted evapotranspiration minus the rainfall adjusted for crop coefficients? So there's a fair bit going on in that question. Uh, Dirk, you'll probably understand what he's getting at there. Yeah, so in the FAO 56 dual crop, um, it is a predicted evapotranspiration. Um, but what is um, different from the single crop is that we split the uh, soil transpiration soil evaporation from um, crop transpiration and, and use, of course, um, indeed, um, crop coefficients and we let them vary throughout the, the year to get a much more accurate estimation of the um, evapotranspiration under, under local conditions. 
Yeah, thanks for that question, Masood. That's really good. Julie Martinson has said, did the scope of this research address possibilities for human pathogens, uh, et cetera, in the irrigation sourced, uh, for example, from Bolivar? Um, I'm not an expert in, in water treatment, uh, but I know that it is class A water, which is fit for irrigation, um, where there is um, disinfection um, with, with chlorine. So I think that, that answers the, uh, the question. Yep. No, thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot for that, Julie. Um, coming back to you, Dirk. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Adrian. Uh, mm. Jiang has asked, what's the cost of getting AEM data? I'm not looking for necessarily a dollar value here, but mm. oh, it would be very expensive putting a plane in the air, I imagine. Yeah, obviously, the, uh, I mean, to Monday from the CSIRO might be um, uh, more, um, yep. uh, you know, be able to answer that question a bit better because he's, yep. he's um, dealing with it all the time. But sure. I can say that um, the APY, um, AEM survey was around about one and a half million. Uh, but of course, uh, the more um, survey area you've got, the cost comes down per uh, line or per kilometre. So, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and uh, look, I'd like both to comment on e uh, both projects uh, as we go through this. Uh, but there's just another question here from Adnan. Have you checked if there's consequences of the recycled water on the quality of the groundwater? You see that question there, uh, Dirk? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting one. Mm. Um, Yes, the numbers the numbers are there. So of course, with with the with with additional irrigation and then the the higher um, um, irrigation rate, um, you do get a higher drainage uh, rate as well, which which will contain um, a load of of, of chemicals. Uh, the numbers are there, uh, but we haven't uh, really looked into it in, in great detail. Uh, we did look at uh, what kind of buffer zone would you need between a, a river, let's say a stream, and um, a piece of land that is a crop with, with vineyards or, or, or grains or potatoes and is irrigated, and what, what the width of that buffer zone has to be to reduce the impact of, of lateral uh, transport of, um, of excess uh, irrigation water, uh, drainage, drainage water, and um, I think we landed somewhere between 40 and, and 60 meters. Mm. Uh, but at the regional scale, it is indeed important to also look at the output from those fields to shallow groundwater. Um, do we need to um, put additional um, drains in place, uh, open drains or, or closed drains? Um, and what is the, the nitrogen load, for instance, or the nitrate load to groundwater and any additional agrochemicals that, that might be present? Um, we have the numbers on, on, the, on the volumes, but we didn't look at um, the, the, the chemistry of, of, those, um, of, of the drainage. No, great. Thank you for that. And thank you for your questions, everybody. We're just about out of time here. Um, so I think we'll close this off right now. And um, just wanted to say how, uh, how much um, we appreciate your time, Dirk and Adrian. Um, and it just appears very clear, clearly that we're building on work from the past and we, 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 we are intent on not making the mistakes of the past, you know, either in the arid areas uh, where you're working, Adrian, or in the areas where you're working, Dirk, not, not to make the, the obvious mistakes of the past and, to, and put a lot of effort into thinking this through. So much appreciated for the, for the work you're doing and all of the colleagues and the science has gone in behind this. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Any closing words from yourself, Dirk or, or Adrian? Oh, it was my first exposure. So yeah, very, very interesting. Excited for this. Yep. Happy to do it again. Yep, let's do it. And I'd love to see what the outcomes are from your work and also from yourself, Adrian. Um, obviously, this is the first well drilled in a paleo, uh, a paleo valley. So you'll be looking to see more things happening there. We'll be looking to see more things happening there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, pretty excited by what we've found so far. But again, we need to do some further work and um, yeah, work out whether it's um, a viable uh, water target. Let us know both when um, a new... Uh, developments occur and we'd be keen to do this again. Thanks so much to you both and thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks there'll be a me. feedback uh, thanks, straight Ryan. after this. Yep, it's great. And there'll be a recording emailed to you. You can see on the screen there now. So, yep, great. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you everyone for joining yeah. us. Bye Thank for you. now. Yep. Bye. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au